Hello, everyone, and welcome to second day of Grab Mini Summit 2020. Um, today, we will have two talks. Uh, first would be from Daniel Extens from um, IBM. He will talk about secure boot without UFI, uh, booting VMs on power architecture. Uh, so thank you, Daniel, for, for joining. Uh, together with Daniel, we have Daniel Keeper, maintainer of uh, Grab and, uh, and PH Coder. Uh, who also joined us today. Um, we also have uh, guys from 3M Dev team. So um, without further ado, let's start uh, first talk from Daniel Axtens. Thank you. Um, so yes, today I'm here to talk about how we're proposing to implement Secure Boot for virtual machines on um, IBM's power systems. So just to set the stage for where uh, we're going. I um, just want to cover uh, a little bit of background about power systems and the boot environment because it is quite different from UFI and some other things. Um, talk a little bit about uh, pendant signatures because we use those a lot. Uh, and then two of the sort of very common links in a secure boot chain. So how we verify Linux from Grub and how we'd verify Grub from firmware. Um, so, firstly, uh, power what now? Uh, what is this power thing of which I speak? Um, so, power, I think, used to be best known for the PowerPC Apple Macs. Um, there were also embedded systems. Uh, also happened a lot uh, in, in game consoles, the GameCube, the Wii, PlayStation 3, I think one of the Xboxes. Um, and IBM made some servers with power chips as well. Um, these days, uh, apart from embedded systems, the, the primary use case for uh, the power architecture is in large enterprise focused servers. So I have here um, a snapshot from one of our brochures. This is a, um, a large, but not the largest power nine system that you can purchase. And uh, as you can see, 48 cores and 16 terabytes of memory in, in its maximum configuration. Um, and they get bigger than this. So they're they're big machines. Um, and importantly for our purposes, um, you can see here built-in IBM PowerVM. Uh, so PowerVM is a, a firmware hypervisor. Uh, so your customer workloads run as these power virtualized uh, logical partitions. And um, so if you're in Linux, this environment is called P-Series. Um, and it's also what you get if you're on a KVM guest. So all of these workloads run inside these logical partitions. Um, and they can be Linux or AAX or IBM I in some cases. What we want to do is to figure out how we could securely boot a Linux LPAR. Um, and to do that, we need to think about, well, how does a power system boot? Um, so it's not UEFI. Um, the boot environment is based on open firmware, which is um, specified in IEEE 1275. And it's fleshed out um, in the way we uh, interact with it and um, implement it is specified more thoroughly in a document called the Power Architecture Platform Reference. Um, so it's a pretty full-fledged firmware environment. Um, it persists while Grub runs to provide a bunch of services. So some IO things um, are all handled by open firmware. It ultimately um, is quiesced by Linux after we get to Linux. Um, apart from that, uh, the configuration is via the device tree, which will be familiar to those of you who've worked with embedded systems. Um, and the bootloader itself is actually defined in PAPA to be a 32-bit big Indian ELF binary. Um, so this is um, distinct from UEFI, which uses the PE format binary. Um, and this is a distinction that will become more important later. Uh, Grub has supported this platform for ages and ages and ages, and it's called PowerPC IEEE 1275. So um, one of the sort of interesting quirks of a boot environment that dates from the 1990s um, is some of the interesting ways firmware can locate a bootloader. 
So if you're first installing your system, what you'll probably do is um, stick, like attach a, um, a CD or a boot USB or something to your virtual machine or your LPAR. And that will contain a file called bootinfo.txt in the PPC directory. That file is sort of HTML or SGML like. Um, it's like angle brackets and ampersand entities and stuff. And it points you off to a file containing an ELF binary and that's what's loaded and run. But once you install your distro, you're no longer loading that way. What you will usually do is create this thing called a prep petition, uh, which is about a four or eight megabyte petition um, sitting usually, it's like the first petition on your, your disk. Inside the prep petition, uh, the bootloader is written out as just raw bytes. Uh, there's no file system, it's just an ELF binary straight into the petition. Um, yeah, so there's no file system, so there's no concept of an end of file. Um, the firmware looks at the ELF header to figure out how big the bootloader is and to read it, or to, I suppose, pass it and run it. Um, you can, of course, also netboot. Um, and again, that will give you a, a file with a, I suppose, a file size that will be sent over the network. Um, so this is, again, quite different to a lot of other things, including UEFI. Um, so we don't, for example, have like an EFI system petition has a file system on it. Uh, the prep petition doesn't. Um, EFI, UEFI specifies where um, you might find an EFI file on removable media. We have an extra layer of indirection. So this is a bit quirky um, and we'll come back to some of these bits later because they interact with how we build a secure boot system. Uh, another key concept for our secure boot system is this thing called appended signatures. Um, and they, I, I'm going to sort of give you the basis for how appended signatures work and then tell you why they matter. Um, they're used across all Linux platforms to sign Linux kernel modules. And um, that's why you see module signature appended there at the bottom because they, it's written for kernel modules. Um, they are at their core an extremely simple way of doing um, signatures. So you get some unmodified data you calculate a signature for it and you wrap it up in this PKCS7 message. You stick that on the end. Um, then you get, um, you calculate the size of that message and you stick some other fixed size metadata on, you stick that after it, and then you stick a magic string. Um, so this is a very simple format to construct. Um, it's a very simple format to verify uh, basically run this Perl script to pull out the various bits and then you can verify it with both an SSL. Um, one of the interesting features of this is that you sort of build it up from top to bottom, but then you parse it from bottom to top, or sort of from front to back and from back to front. So you go to the end of the file and you check the signature magic, and then you read the metadata, and then you read the PKCS7 message and then at the start of your PKCS7 message is the end of your unmodified data. Um, so this front to back and back to front thing will matter later as well. Um, we care about this because um, appended signatures were, they were originally used to sign kernel modules, but they can also be used to sign kernels. Um, so, for open power secure boot. So we also sell machines that don't have power VM. They call open power machines. Um, they boot almost exclusively with K exec, or exclusively with K exec. So um, you actually boot a Linux environment. The Linux environment goes and finds your installed systems and K execs into those kernels. Um, and that's you know your host operating system. Because we have that system, um, 
and because that's not also not UEFI, all of our kernels are um, just straight ELF binaries. They don't have the UEFI wrapper um, that a lot of x86 kernels are built for. Um, so we can't inject a sort of PE or authentic code signature like you could on a UEFI platform. So what we instead do, and what some distros have already started doing to support open power secure boot, uh, is to sign the kernels with an appended signature. And then the Linux kernel, the IMA um, subsystem, knows how to verify appended signatures when you're k-execing. And so that's sort of the foundation of open power secure boot. So a bunch of our kernels are already signed with appended signatures and maybe that's something we can reuse. So all of that background um, is to set us up to get to here. So how would we construct a um, secure boot system? We implicitly trust firmware. So I've got PFW, which is partition firmware, which is the PowerVM firmware here. We implicitly trust that because of host secure boot. PFW loads Grub and that's not verified. Grub loads Linux and that's also not verified. Um, so for a secure boot chain, we want to close both of those locks and we want to verify both of those steps. Um, so what we will start with, I think, is the grub to Linux link, because that's a bit simpler. So as I've said, a bunch of um, kernels for power, distro kernels for power, are already signed with appended signatures. So what we'd like to do is to teach grub to verify those appended signatures against an X509 certificate um, that is embedded into Grub. And, you know, because we um, like to write less code rather than more code, we want to use uh, existing Grub features and concepts as much as we can. So the verifier interface is designed for this sort of thing, so we hook into that. Um, we are inspired by the way public keys are embedded for the GPG verifier, so we uh, extend that concept to embed um, X509 certificates. Uh, we can look at the way the shimlock verifier has a list of dangerous modules that we might also care about. Uh, so lots of code reuse, and um, especially because crypto code is, is quite hard and I like to be humble about my ability to write it, uh, we want to borrow as much of that as we can. Um, so the world doesn't need another ASN1 parser in C, uh, but PKCS7 and X509 are both based on ASN1. So we propose importing libtasn1, which is LGPL 2.1 um, into Grub. That's a compatible license, so that's helpful. And that allows us to parse um, the crypto cryptographic material out of those um, ASN1 data structures. ASN1, unfortunately, is not, um, the schema is not self-documenting. Uh, so we borrow the schema definitions from G, uh, GNU TLS, and then we use existing Gcrypt code to do the actual maths. Um, all of this means we actually have to write quite a small amount of code. All we have to write is the code to actually peer into the PKCS7 message in X509 certificates and extract um, the relevant parts. So the, the signature, the public key, um, those sorts of things. And then we have to write up the code to tie it together and link it into the verifier interface. Um, so all up, this works out to be about 2000 lines, of uh, 2000 lines, and that includes code and white space and comments. Um, uh, not including tests and documentation and um, things we import. Um, so that is at least nice and small um, and supports embedding multiple certificates. So you can do key rotation, for example, if you're a distro, you want to embed um, a key for, in grab a key for this generation of kernels and a key for your previous release and a key for your next release, so that all should work. Um, and that is actually all we need um, to secure that step from Grub to Linux. Uh, that is unfortunately the easy part, um, but are there any questions on that before? Actually, the only people who are gonna be able, 
I don't know how we're doing questions, but any questions on that before I move on to the PFW to Grub stage? Um, uh, I, I have a small a small question. Uh, so yes. do I understand correct that you plan to embed the keys into Grub itself uh, against which uh, Linux kernel will be verified? Yes, that's correct. Mm -hmm. Okay, thanks. So the so, question... I'm sorry, Daniel. I, I was just going to say the, um, the hope is that uh, one day in the future, um, there'll be an ability to uh, bring your own keys, but we don't have a design for that at this point. Yeah, in terms of well, questions... That's essentially what Shim does, but you're just skipping Shim and doing that part in Grub instead. Yeah. Okay, okay. Just, to, just to let you know about um, how to ask uh, questions, like, People watching live stream on YouTube, of course, can ask through chat. And uh, anyone who is on the Zoom call also can ask. So uh, I see Alexander Burmashev um, joined. From Oracle. Yeah. From Oracle, yeah. Um, yeah, so thank you, Alexander, for joining and, and participating in the discussion. So I believe we can continue if there are. Uh, no I have questions. a question. Uh, Daniel, um, are there any plans to? have any functionality in firmware which uh, will allow you to verify the signature uh, uh, from the grab of the Linux kernel or, or anything else? Something similar so, to the shim. You, you said that uh, you have something right. to the shim. So the question is, um, do we plan to have a way for grub to ask firmware to verify Linux? Yeah, exactly. Okay. Um, I want to be careful to say that I can't really say what IBM will do in the future, um, but this does not, this scheme that I have at the moment does not involve Grub asking firmware to verify something. Um, and I don't, um, yeah, at the moment, no. Uh, at the moment, Grub is doing the verification of the next step. Okay. Or perhaps the PFE could export the keys that it, that, that it trusts. Um, that would, so at the moment it doesn't. Uh, at the moment, um, if you want to have the same key sign grub as sign linux it needs to be embedded in both um, pfw and grub um, sort of future times there will um, be a bring your own key infrastructure that makes more sense um, but at the moment um, the proposal is just for um, static keys everywhere okay and uh... Did you consider also uh, so ELF signatures rather than append appended signatures? What do you mean by an ELF signature? I mean there is a, a specification for 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 having signatures as one of the ELF segments. Um, I haven't seen this specification, so I'll I'll have to um get you to um post a link to it somewhere. Um. But for the kernel, at least, um, it is already signed with an appended signature. And I don't want to say, you know, if you want a kernel to boot on both open power and um, uh, power VM, then it needs to have two different signature schemes. Uh, so I, I want to have only silly. one. Which would be silly and impractical. Yeah. Yeah. Um, but hold that thought because you might want to ask that question again in a few minutes. Uh, so let's talk about the PFW to Grub stage. Um, unlike uh, the Grub to Linux stage, we don't have a pre-existing set of signatures staring us in the face saying, do this. Um, so we have to think a little bit harder. 
Um, the first thing that I really want is to be backwards compatible. Um, so I want to make sure that I'm not um, wildly changing the binary formats or the partition formats or anything like that. Uh, I want to have one installer install a system uh, that works on an older system that doesn't support secure boot, that works on a newer system that does support secure boot, that works with secure boot on, with secure boot off. Um, I want as little detection and magic in the installer as possible. Um, I'd like to reuse tools and concepts where possible and where it makes sense. Um, so um, there were some other things. Um, there's a secure boot capsule format defined by firmware that's documented as part of open power, but that looked like it would be quite complex to interoperate with um, the processes that we that you would already have as a distro for signing Linux with an appended signature. Um, so basically what we thought was, well, let's see if we can sign Grub with an appended signature as well. Um, Linux with them, we might as well try and use the same processes. Um, since we came up with that, uh, another, we, we had some discussions at Linux Plumbers Conference and a big thing that came up was an ability to support signers. Um, so what do I mean by that? Um, there are basically two big use cases that were put to me. Um, so one is the very obvious sort of key rotation thing. So you're a district, um, you want to uh, sign Grub with a particular sort of key uh, for one firmware release and then you go, okay, you know, it's the next major revision of our distribution. We want to sign it with another key. Um, that will go into firmware eventually, but we need some sort of ability to be verified with either key. That's pretty straightforward. Um, both signatures are made at the same time. Um, you have access to all of the key material when you're making the signature. The more challenging use case is one where you are um, an administrator of some production infrastructure and you want to take a distro binary. Uh, you want to keep the distro binary signature so that you can, I don't know, boot it on your test infrastructure or something. But you want to add a signature specifically for your um, production infrastructure. So you say your production infrastructure only trusts specific keys um, and those are not the distro keys. Uh, so these signatures are then made at different points in time and the second signer doesn't have access to the first signer's key material. So the first question is, you know, does this work with appended signatures at all? Um, the answer is yes, it does, at least in theory. Uh, so the PKCS7 message format is capable of having multiple uh, signer info substructures, I suppose, uh, that can have a different uh, signature, signature certificate issuer and a different um, you know, encrypted digest or a different signature. Um, there's some question marks on tooling to do this. Uh, OpenSSL can kind of do the first one, the first use case, um, but really struggles with the second use case. Um, but I've only tried with the CLI, so you know, maybe the API can do it better. Um, but at least, you know, appended signatures can support this um, because PKCS7 can support this. So that's good. Um, that's half the problem. Um, <laughs> Second half of the problem that we have for um, verifying Grub from firmware uh, is the question of how firmware knows an appended signature is present. So going back to the, one of the first things I said was, one of the ways that we can load Grub is from a thing called the prep petition. The prep petition doesn't have a file system. So it doesn't have a file size. So there's no clear end of file. So this means you can't skip to the end of the file and check for the module signature magic um, because there's no concept of an end of file. Um, all that there is is the ELF headers and um, a uh, naive appended signature doesn't, isn't contained within the ELF structure. Um, 
we can't just sort of skip forward a fixed amount to find it because the length of that PKCS7 message will vary depending on the number of signers, uh, the signing keys because the issuer's name is included and the type of hash you're using. Uh, we isn't also- the length of, Isn't the length of PKCS message part of the beginning of the PKCS message? Yes. Um, but if you're in a prep petition, uh, you will read the ELF header and the ELF header will say, my ELF file extends for the following bytes. Um, and then, like, then what? I mean, you could read the next few bytes and interpret them as a PKCS7 message and see if that works. Um, the reason I'm not super keen on that um, is that you end up with, if you have installed, so you initially install a signed grub um, and then you install an unsigned grub, it is difficult then for firmware to be able to tell you whether there is a signature that exists that is invalid or whether there is a missing signature. Um, and you know that's not the end of the world, but it would just be really nice to be able to provide useful error messages to a sysadmin. Um, okay. Um, so what we sort of want um, is for all of the data to be um, within an ELF structure. Um, so that way, um, you know, firmware can read this entire thing. It's parsing the ELF header to figure out how big the ELF file is and what it contains. And now the appended signature is contained within that ELF file. Um, we also want to maintain a bunch of the properties of appended signatures that we really like, um, which is that they're really simple and dumb. Uh, they're a, a dumb signature over the entire file. Um, and our existing tools can um, parse them and extract the PKC7 message, do the verification very simply. Um, so what I have proposed to do um, is for Grub and for Grub only, and potentially for PAPC IEEE 12.75 only, uh, that we add in an ELF note. Um, so this is an ELF section that sits at the end of the file and it provides a place within the ELF binary uh, such that um, the appended signature is both contained within the extent of the ELF file and sits at the end of the file. Um, the signature is still made over um, everything up to, like, up to and including the ELF note. Um, and then the signature is within the ELF file as well. Um, this works quite nicely. Um, we've got it working internally. We've got it working on a, um, a public um, grub branch. That we've, I mean, we've posted the patches um, and we've got a working sloth that will verify this. A complexity though, uh, is there's multiple signatures. Uh, <laughs> multiple signatures, multiple signatures. Um, the elf note and the elf header uh, contain the size on a size of the appended signature and are themselves signed. So if you're adding both signatures at the same time, that's fine um, because you know what size it is. But if you add another signature in later, either you will spill this appended signature out beyond the end of the elf file and then firmware won't believe that it has a valid signature or you have to change the size of the ELF node. And if you change the size of the ELF node because the size is hashed into the signature, you will break the original signature. Um, one thing you could do perhaps is to exclude the size from the data that you're signing. So you could maybe set it to zero before you're signing, or you could just actually just chop out those bits. Um, but that then ends up breaking some of the appended signature properties that we really like. 
um, it being oblivious to the data being signed, it being able to be made and verified with standard tools, you then have a much more complicated signing process and verification process. And what we really don't want to do is end up reinventing authentic code, but worse. Um, and that's a, a risk with messing around with not signing particular things. So there are two potential ways we could do this. There's one that I've come up with and there's one that um, Michael from Suze has come up with. Um, this is my idea. Um, and this is sort of obviously the one I prefer. Um, what we can do is the PKCS7 message, um, we can add in some padding after that. Um, and we can include that in the size that we report in the metadata. Um, a PKCS7 parser will ignore this padding because the PKCS7 ASN1 says how long it is. Um, and then we can eat into that padding later on if we want to add it, another signature. Um, this means we keep all of our nice appended signature properties. It's over all of the data. We don't have to mess with the data. We don't have to teach it how to read an ELF binary. Um, so we don't have to teach the signing or verification process that there are magic fields or anything like that. Um, and we keep the nice property that all of the appended signature verification operates in the ELF parser. Um, downsides are you get a non-trivial limit to the number of signatures you can add. I mean, you could make that like 20 kilobytes and then you would be able to add probably quite a lot of signatures, but you know, it's the, it, there is a limit. Um, and there's somewhat of an abuse of the size field. Um, the other thing you could do is just ditch entirely the idea of an elf note. Um, so this has been discussed on the list if you sort of want to dig into it. Um, completely discard the elf note and just stick the signature at the end. Then if you get your file from the chirp uh, PPC boot info file, you have a file size and you can read the appended signature. If you get it from netboot, you have a file size and you can read the appended signature. If it's in the prep petition, what the proposal is, is to split this with grub install, stick the binary at the beginning of the prep petition where firmware expects it, and stick the appended signature at the end of the prep petition. Um, so a pro is that you can then fit as many signatures as your prep petition will fit, and that would be a stupidly large number. Um, the cons are, to me, is some of, some of the properties of appended signatures. We've now broken the idea that the signature is computed over all of the preceding data, because it's computed over all of the preceding data, unless it's from the prep petition, in which case it's computed over the ELF data. Um, or you compute it over all the pre preceding, uh, sorry, is, yes, if it's in the prep petition, it's computed over the size in the ELF header. Perhaps as an implementation detail, you could say um, it's always computed over the size in the ELF header. Um, but then if you find the file from um, the chirp boot info file from netboot that has this extra padding, what do you do? Um, do you complain about it? In which case you need to keep track of where you've got it from, whether it's allowed to have that padding. There, there's some implementation complexity. Um, how much that is depends on your firmware implementation. And um, so where this leaves us, um, this is sort of what I want to say about it. Um, as we've said, um, we don't currently have an announced timeframe for a bring your own keys solution. And our current designs presuppose static keys. So you can't actually do the second use case. You can't actually add um, a signature of your own because you have no way to get firmware to trust that key that you want to sign with. Um, the good news is that going down one of these approaches doesn't lock us out of the other one. So if we stick with an ELF node approach for now, um, and we come 
back to doing the full design and we go, actually, um, the other design would have been better. Um, it is at least technically possible. I mean, it would be annoying, but it's technically possible to um, check for either um, go with, is there one at the end of the prepetition? Okay, let's trust that. Otherwise, let's look for one at the end in an alpha node or something like that. It's, it's possible. Um, so while I am pursuing the elf note approach for now, I am happy to be talked around later on. Um, and so, sorry to keep up a pretty breakneck pace, but I want to make sure that we've got time for questions. Um, the summary of the whole design is basically appended signatures everywhere. Um, so we say that Grub is signed with an appended signature and we add an elf note to the Grub core image uh, to tell firmware that there is an appended signature and where it should look to find it. Uh, then we say we can embed X509 certificates in Grub. Grub can parse the appended signature on the Linux kernel and verify it against the embedded certificates. Um, I've talked about all of this in the context of PowerPC, but there's nothing especially PowerPC specific about it and it should be portable to other platforms um, if anyone particularly wants to. Um, and so that should give us a working secure root chain um, where firmware verifies Grub and Grub verifies Linux. Um, I just like this diagram. Um, so are there questions on either the Grub, the firmware to Grub or the full summary? Um, and then I'll talk about very briefly about um, upstream status. I saw, uh, Daniel, I saw your patches on the Grub Devel. Uh, does these patches implement all the functionality which you discussed during this presentation? Yes. Okay, perfect. Uh, sorry, I'm not able to take a look at them at the moment because currently I'm focusing on the release. Yes, but uh, I consider this a very interesting feature and I think that uh, I will get back to you to uh, work on this. I hope that I, I, at least uh, uh, after RC1 and then I will be able to discuss uh, all details of, of the present, I think. But I like, I like this idea and my understanding is that uh, it, mm, it can be used also by other platforms, not, not only by IEEE uh, 1275 uh, uh, platforms. Yeah, there isn't anything um, power or open firmware specific about, um, I mean, your firmware has to know how to verify the signature on Grub, um, but there's no magic like this is, you know, we're adding the support in our firmware for this appended signature note as well. So, um, and being able to verify appended signatures on the kernel it should absolutely be be portable to anything. Okay, perfect. I, I have one more question. Uh, mm. Does this node is pointed from a elf header, uh, or it, it exists, uh, and you have uh, know the the size of elf, and then jump to the elf node? How how is it integrated with uh, elf file? Yep. So, in the this is sort of a limitation of my data. Uh, in the ELF program headers, uh, you include basically a pointer to this section and you say that it is an ELF note um, and it's offset and it's size. Um, and then the ELF note itself contains a type, a name, a name size, a description size and a description. And that's, those fields are the definition of an elf note they're not specific to our elf note um, and so we say the type is a sig we say the name is appended signature and the description we fill in with the appended signature so there's a little bit up here in the top in the program header and then there's um, that points you to this note um, which uh, we um, firmware should verify and grub mk image will always put right at the end of the file. Okay, so my understanding is that uh, the LF file is uh, 
uh, uh, fully compatible uh, compatible with uh, ELF specification and doesn't contain any additional things which we require uh, from the specification itself, right? Yes, so implementations are allowed to define their own ELF nodes. Um, we aren't doing anything that is breaking the ELF standard. Um, so if you look at, um, for example, a binary on a modern Red Hat system, they've added a bunch of ELF notes to track uh, compiler flags and SHA hashes of source files. I forget what the, um, the feature is called, but it's part of their security work. Um, so you're allowed to add ELF notes um, and we add it in a way that is compatible with uh, the ELF format. Okay, perfect. That's great. Was it tested on the all the power, power Mac machines? Because it, even so theoretically it's compatible, I can easily see them or them choking over it. Um, I haven't checked because I don't have a old Power Mac machine on hand. Uh, okay, it, then, uh, then, uh, then I will check it. Yeah, I'm certainly able to check it in Quemu um, and there's probably an old, there's at least a G5 in the hardware lab, um, but I don't know how far back our hardware lab goes. But yeah, I would appreciate um, checking it. Uh, you don't necessarily need to put a signature in, you can just um, grab MK image has a flag now to create the elf note and you can just create it. It'll fill it all with zeros and then that will be sufficient to see whether it crashes an old Mac. Yeah. But I mean, you don't have to add it. Like it's not that every PowerPC I, PowerPC IEEE 1275 image will necessarily contain an appended signature note. You have to pass a flag to create it. Um, so it's if you're it's making one I, for an I, old I, machine. Yeah. Actually, if um, if uh, if we start, we can if we start with the flag and we find out that all machines we support uh, are fine with it, then I pro I would propose to ditch the flag and and perhaps even by by now just ditch a flag and always add it so that it uh just so we have less less variance if there is no drawback in it the only complexity is that we need to know the size to allocate when we're building the image um so that's i didn't go into the detail very much here but because you need um because the pkcs7 message size can change um you need to be able to figure out how big your PKCS7 message is going to be when you create the ELF note. Um, we got some good feedback from a different Michael from Suze to make Grub install smart enough to figure this out for you. Um, but at the moment you have to figure it out first. Yeah, it depends on the signing algorithms a lot. Yes, yes. But we can, uh... Since uh, this prep partition is uh, in in megabytes, we can always say that it's something like thirty two kilobytes by default. Yeah. Yep. Absolutely. And that you know, means that we the multiple signer case is um, easily handled. Um, I I didn't want to fix the size. I wanted to make sure that we can specify it. But I'm I think thirty two k is a very good default. Yeah, I, I wouldn't want to fix it either, especially now, since we have a, a moment when several companies might reach uh, quantum supremacy or may have reached. And so, so it's quite possible that three years down the road, we'll use quantum resistant cryptography, which uses different, different signature sizes. Yeah. I think we should continue um, since we are starting to be a little bit late. So my apologies. Um, no problem. Like it's it's completely okay. Uh, but uh, I believe you have some slides uh, left. Oh, um, just that um, patches are on the list. Um, so there's a series to sign Grub with the appended signature, a series to verify appended signatures of Linux from Grub. Um, 
there is uh, the only thing that's IEEE 1275 relevant is this last one um, where we um, check that, where we can look at a firmware property from the device tree and um, enforce signature verification in a way that can't be disabled from the grub command line. Um, yeah, and um, that's all I had. Thank you, Daniel, for doing this for us. Uh, one more question. Uh, uh, if I remember correctly, you posted some RFCs earlier. Uh, may I ignore them and uh, I should review the latest one or should I take a look at some earlier patches too? If, um, I, if I'm not, not confused. So the signing, verifying appended signatures from Grub is up to V2. Signing Grub with an appended signature I can't remember what RFCs I have sent. Okay. Um, I will have a look. I will send you an email. Okay, um, thanks a lot. No problem. I understand yeah. how it works. Once again, thanks a lot for doing this for us. Yeah. Especially that it is quite late for you, as I, as I understand. Right now. Yes. Um, so thank you very much for the invite. Uh, I think I have very much run uh, out of my time slot. Uh, mm -hmm. So I wish you all the best of luck for the rest of the um, the mini summit and I look forward to checking out the uh, the YouTube videos when it is um, a more sensible hour in Canberra. Okay, no problem. Thank you very much. That was great to have your talk and it was very interesting. Thanks. Thank you. See you later. Talk to you all later. Bye. Hello everyone and welcome to my talk, um, which would be about I am um, AMD Trend Boot support in Grab2. My name is Pat Krull. I'm a core boot contributor and maintainer. Uh, I'm conference speaker and co-organizer, trained at various organizations. I'm former Intel BIOS software engineer, 12 years in business, and from six years I'm doing open source firmware um, and spreading the word about open, open source firmware. I'm also a C-level at various um, organizations, but maybe this is not most important. Um, first of all, I want to thank uh, NLNet Foundation for sponsoring the trench boot uh, AMD port. Uh, that was a very important part uh, and a very important uh, contribution. Um, then Daniel Smith, um, I believe I, I miss here also Daniel Keeper, but uh, it's like obvious that Daniel Keeper is also an important person uh, for uh, supporting us. Daniel Smith yeah, for so. supporting the trench boot design and, and driving that and in inventing that, that project. Uh, Andrew Cooper for, for also doing some stuff in LZ and amazing uh, 3M dev team, Michal, Christian, Norbert for putting together various uh, demonstrations um, um, and software stack that we can uh, see in this presentation later. So what's my goal in this presentation? Um, I would like to present um, a pra practical approach, how, how practically trench boot can be integrated and how we can leverage it, its features in uh, through Grab2. Um, and uh, we will do that on AMD based platform. So what we will see here and what we will discuss would be difference between um, static core root of trust uh, for measurement or rather static code root of trust for measurement uh, versus dynamic root of trust for, for measurement. What are the differences and why even it, it uh, matters. And then uh, role of Grab2 in trench boot. Um, then um, how architecture of feature rich system can look like uh, when we leverage Grab2 and trench boot. And then I will talk about something about Dasharo firewall, which is open source um, BIOS firmware technology. Use it in this presentation in, in demos, which will show um, on further slides as well as uh, uh, Yocto and Grab2, how we build that, how we put together the system, a uh, little bit practical information. Then uh, system features and demo. So let's start with static code root of trust for measurement. So static code root of trust for measurement is, is an initial measurement uh, established uh, statically by static component of the system, which may be, for example, some code, which is in boot ROM, or it's a piece of read-only spy flash, um, or maybe this is some code which, which resides in separate chip, 
like management engine or, or platform security uh, processor. Um, and this code initiate first measurement of the um, initiate first measurement of the boot process. Um, and typically this code is not updatable, although uh, there are there are some um, possibilities here. Um, but for example, uh, in NXP we have bootrom and, and this code is not updatable. What are the use cases for static uh, code root of transfer measurement? Um, typically we, we think about Intel boot guard or AMD uh, hardware validated boot or NXP um, hardware assured boot. Um, so those are the commercial uh, terms for, for using that. Uh, there, is, there are also some components that then continue this um, chain of trust initiated by SRT, uh, SCRTM. Uh, and those components can be Intel Secure Boot, uh, IBV Secure Boot, which for example can be AMI or Phoenix Secure Boot. And then finally we get to the point when there is UFI Secure Boot, which then continues the chain of trust further. Um, one of the commercial use cases for, for this, uh, for measured uh, boot uh, is uh, Microsoft BitLocker. Uh, of course, like uh, I'm, I'm not messing here the verified boot path and uh, measured boot, despite it looks like that. Uh, but uh, if you look at UFI secure boot, it also measures components uh, which, which are executed. Um, despite verifying components, it also measures them. Um, there are open source use cases for that. Uh, for example, um, there is core boot uh, which can leverage trusted grab uh, tool, uh, which is fork of grab with support for um, int one A uh, interface. Uh, this is a like legacy uh, support for uh, TPM, which helps in measuring um, legacy OS. It also, also can be Dasharo, uh, 3MD Dasharo firmware, uh, with LUX, um, so we will present the similar configuration later. What are the problems of SRTM, uh, SCRTM? First of all, uh, to establish trust, uh, we need reboot. Uh, then second thing is typically to provision S SCRTM, all those Intel boot guard, AMD, HVB, and, and so on, we need ND8 with silicon vendor. Vendor. And to be honest, like even if you have this NDA, like 3 um, dep you have all the documents, you have all the knowledge, but then problem is it requires very skilled personnel to uh, pro uh, perform provisioning. And even then there, there is no proof that there are no bugs in documentation or implementation that in certain situation cause some weird configuration, to be honest, not secure configuration. Um, so the process is very complex. Um, and, and we proved that many times there are even some public bugs related to um, SCRTM. Um, the measurements uh, which this kind of configuration cause uh, and is dropped in event log is not standardized. Sometimes we just get in garbage, which is hard to read. Um, and yeah, so most major vendors, which I will show on for the slides do not implement that correctly. Um, from um, SafeBoot website, you can you can read that there are uh, over 20 keys involved in platform security, which uh, around five of five of them are related to Intel Boot Guard. So we see how big complexity is related to the um, SCRTM provisioning, maintaining, and then uh, using. And of course, without correct correct SCRTM, so this first measurement. Uh, all the measured, uh, measurements which are uh, delivered further does not have much value. Uh, this diagram presents some kind of um, high level overview of UFI SCRTM implementation. So on the left side, you can see uh, some closed source, typically uh, not updatable component like, uh, like Bootrom, or it can be like, uh, another chip like a platform security processor or management engine. And these components have some code which establish static co uh, code root of trust for measurement by measuring first stage or some part of first stage. Uh, it really uh, varies from vendor to vendor. 
and those measurements uh, may or uh, sometimes are, but 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 to be honest, it's hard to identify uh, if those are those measurements uh, are stored in TPM uh, in the PCRs static uh, root of trust for measurement PCRs zero to seven. And then uh, we have classical um, UFI boot process, which uh, base is based on UFI firmware stored in system ROM. So we have SEC, PAY, Dixie, and BDS. Uh, in the commercial implementation of UFI from AMI Phoenix Insight, typically there is some glue between PAY and Dixie phase. Uh, to continue between silicon vendor security technology like Intel BootGuard uh, to UFI secure boot technology. Uh, so because, because the silicon vendor security technology ends at after the pay and UFI secure boot starts at Dixie. So there have to be some glue. Um, we call it this glue independent BIOS vendor security technology, which can be AMI secure boot, for example. At, at Passing between the stages, all the time we're getting some measurements uh, to TPM. Uh, then we have BDS. Uh, maybe we'll start with Dixie. Dixie starts the UFI secure boot path, uh, which is documented in official uh, specification. And then we have uh, BDS bootloader. And this is how typically um, SCT, SCTRTM is used. So as I said, we have no knowledge what is exactly measured. Uh, event log is not standardized. Um, this is just uh, like the number of PCRs are just an example because uh, they can easily use uh, um, almost any PCR except those related with the RTM. So you can see how complex it is. Uh, in a presentation in 2017, Alex Matrosov on, um, on one of the conferences uh, showed this table. Uh, he, at that conference, showed uh, how uh, he can break Intel BootGuard for gigabyte bricks. But please uh, take a look at, at the columns BootGuard uh, for various uh, vendors like Asus, MSI, Dell, Lenovo, HP, uh, Intel, Apple. So you can see that either it is disabled um, Either it is enabled, but then there is some configuration which is missing and, and problematic. We can see that Dell doing here quite well. Uh, HP got this uh, completely disabled. Lenovo as well. Uh, Intel also. So it looks like um, SCRTM is not implemented very well across the um, hardware we get from major vendors. That's why we need something different uh, or uh, close the the gap that we have here, um, and that's why uh, TrenchBoot was created. So TrenchBoot is, um, is open source implementation of dynamic root of trust for measurement. Uh, dynamic root of trust for measurement uh, technology was specified by Trusted Computing Group um, in 2013. There was publication of the specification. Um, and it kind of helps in avoiding consideration about this complex SCRTM stuff and move on to, uh, to something more simpler. Um, of course, it has its own problems, but uh, maybe this simplifies thing, things and for security, it should be better. Um, so it, it, to some extent, it solves measurement verified boot continuation problem. Maybe not solves, but replace it. Uh, like kind of avoid it and and use it in different way because um, it leverages special CPU instruction um, uh, in AMD is it is SKINIT um, in uh, Intel it's GetSec uh, Open Power or Power got also its own implementation and and probably other like ARM uh, will also have something like that using uh, Trust Zone. So what we see on this diagram from the uh, the RTM specification is that when we power on uh, our platform, then we may have some stage of preparation of the RTM. This not happened for AMD. This is only valid for Intel. Uh, this is done by um, ACM um, BIOS component, um, which, which have to be inside your BIOS on the platform. And then we have the gap, uh, which is our BIOS. We don't know exactly what's going on there. Uh, it, there can be SRTM or uh, um, it can be also validated by the SCRTM. 
and just some code uh, executes in GAP. What is important in GAP is uh, that at some point it uh, prepares um, dynamically or the uh, DRTM um, configuration environment, uh, preamble. So it prepares environment for running the RTM process and then um, issue a dynamic launch event, which is exactly the CPU instruction that I mentioned. And that means uh, we land in uh, the, uh, the RTM configuration environment, which for Intel would be execution of ACM um, as init binary and for the AMD, it would be um, trench boot landing zone, the open source implementation of the DCE for AMD. And this component is self-measured, in initiate uh, dyn dynamically uh, measured and uh, root of trust, um, which means that it um, the special instruction measures the component. In case of AMD, it's 64K uh, landing zone binary. And it extends PCR 17 with the, with the, with that value. And um, so this uh, this is hardware isolated environment in which uh, we start new um, uh, measured environment. And then uh, from that point we can continue a new chain of trust and ignore everything what was in the past. Um, when we continue it, we typically run some Linux or some some other code. Uh, so LZ can then measure further components in the boot chain. So uh, it all, so I, as I said, it solves uh, uh, the problem, for example, of uh, using unmaintained un unmaintained trusted grab two or um, the need for int one a um, uh, interrupt uh, for um, measurements, uh, which was exposed, for example, by CBIOS. Um, we discussed that on Linux Plumber, Plumber's conference uh, in the past, and the link is uh, on the bottom of the uh, presentation slides. So that's that's how it helps. So what's the role of uh, of the grab here? Maybe let's let's jump back uh, to this previous slides. So first of all, um, grab uh, prepares the environment for uh, for calling this um, special instruction. So it, it has to prepare this environment and then um, through its modules uh, helps running in correct way this uh, um, dynamic launch event. On our platform that we're using uh, core boot based platform and on our platform, it would look like that. Uh, we have uh, power on, then we have some core boot. Of course, there it can be rich in ways that it can verify some components then at some point we may have grab as a payload or grab as a component which is on the storage. Both configuration work fine, and then grab um, use s launch module built in into grab and then call sk init, uh, which uh, measures the landing zone, transient boot landing zone, and then continue the chain of trust, um, um, booting further components in the in the boot chain. Um, so we can say that uh, in case of trench boot, uh, grab is reference bootloader implementation. Um, based on this, we hope that other um, bootloaders or other components booting the system uh, will adapt the approach and learn how to use trench boot. History of uh, AMD support or maybe trench boot support in grab is as follows. Uh, in December 2019, uh, around um, Grab2 Mini Summit uh, 2019, we had um, uh, first working patches, which we presented to Daniel. Uh, there's, there's even video recording. After the presentation, Daniel did review and kind of provided his um, um, concerns about various pieces of code. Um, then we, we took that and, and fixed it. Uh, in May uh, 2020, there was first uh, working implementation of Intel TXT patches. Um, and then right now, like today, we sent, we rebased uh, AMD patches on, on top of those Intel TXT patches and sent another version uh, with fixes that, um, with fixes for the addressing the review, uh, which Daniel provided us um, last year. Um, what we tested is uh, we, we for testing we used PCMs APU2 
um, like 100 euro firewall, uh, which is based on AMD uh, G series embedded processor, but it supports uh, this special SK init instruction. And we used uh, two configuration. We uh, we used Grab um, as a payload, so Core Boot plus Grab as a payload, and Grab plus UFI payload. And in both configuration works fine. Uh, we also tried various storage, so like either in everything in SPI or also something on the disk. Currently, uh, the uh, size of changes is like around 30, 39 files, around 4K um, insertions, like very little bit of deletion as in all uh, patches that add features. Uh, you can find the patch uh, behind this link. So how the system architecture um, would look like for, for the solution? So we have our CPU, which support uh, DRTM SK init. We need uh, TPM, like physical TPM, uh, because um, we found that firmware TPMs typ typically uh, do not support um, DRTM. Uh, for Intel, it can be it can be different. I don't know how if there were, were tests with FTPM and if this if this work uh, correctly. Then for legacy version we will have a firmware in which we will have grab to as a payload and landing zone as a um, as our dce um, and then uh, we typically use um, open embedded yocto build linux stack which then is run as a dynamically launched measured environment so we can say um, that this um, um, this configuration um, kind of helps us validate and uh, leverage all the features that um, this stack can provide. We also um, encrypt disk uh, and we can uh, seal the secret to the PCRs that can be extended only by uh, the RTM. So this is, uh, this is some additional feature, full disk encryption through, um, through LUX um, or full rootFS encryption through LUX. This is some additional feature which we can use. This diagram is for legacy boot, uh, boot path. Um, yeah, as I, I, I was said, all the comments here. So um, as a firmware, we're using Dasharo. Uh, Dasharo is a, is a family of BIOS firmware products uh, which are based completely on, on open source. Uh, it's produced by 3MDeb. Um, in this case, we have Dash, Dasharo firewall. There are other flavors of Dasharo. This Dasharo, Dasharo firewall works for uh, with legacy boot, with uh, UFI boot path. Um, it is compatible with various uh, hardware components, uh, with firewalls from PC engines, APU 2, 3, 4, 6, uh, from um, firewalls from Protectly, um, FW2, 4, and 6. Um, and to be honest, any other platform, uh, like a firewall-like platform, or any, to be honest, any platform that supports core boot, could be enabled to support the same stack. We use core boot um, for 12 uh, with enabled verified boot. Um, we also enabled something, um, we also enabled recovery partition, which means if a verified boot sum, somehow fails, it uh, just um, fall back to the very small minimal Linux, which is run from SPI. And then you have tools like flash or GPG uh, to pull the firmware, verify its signature, and flush it, uh, so you can fix fix the situation in which you um, happen to land. Uh, as an optional thing, um, we may replace uh, SPI chip uh, to support read-only boot block. Uh, how it works is SPI can uh, simply permanently lock part of the firm, uh, part of the SPI. Um, and uh, simply we will put that some small co code base, like boot block part of the core boot. And this boot block creates, creates static core root of trust for measurement. Um, of course, this uh, boot block can be fully verified because you can uh, build the code from the, from the source and verify if, if the boot block is the same um, as the one flushed on SPI. Um, I'm, I don't see. I don't know if you see a lot on this on this graphics, but uh, this is um, Tiano Core payload um, or UEFI boot path 
for the shadow firewall. Um, it's, it is just a classical um, setup menu of UFI uh, system, uh, but, but just shown through the serial. Um, on the on the demo, I will it will show with colors, so maybe it would be more um, eye appearing. What we support here is UFI Secure Boot. Uh, we have of course a setup menu. We have Boot Order Manager. Uh, we have Network uh, Boot through IPXC. Uh, we have uh, support for um, uh, TPM and Opal menu, and we can also set HDD uh, password. Uh, for grab to uh, component in our software stack, uh, right now, of course, like we have unstable kind of uh, not, not really stable uh, 2.05 uh, version with the patches which were published. You can get those on mailing list. Um, as I said, um, as I said, we have those two boot paths. And for example, if we want to, um, if we want to launch the uh, trench boot, or dynamic. We, we want to dynamically establish root of trust for measurement. Uh, we just have to add in the grab config following uh, following lines. In previous patches, uh, the S launch needed parameter um, SK init um, or the or the Intel counterpart. Um, the new S patches do not need that. Um, and yeah, so and then so first we saying that we want to do the S launch. Then we saying that um, we want to load S launch module and we show the location of the trench boot landing zone uh, binary. And then, uh, then of course, we can say like, where is the kernel? In this case, uh, the kernel is integrated, um, has built in in TranFS. So there is no need for um, further components. To build everything together and to kind of test that and flash that uh, on our firewall platform, we use uh, open embedded uh, Yocto. And it's just, we have like all the recipes, uh, we have um, special uh, meta layers like meta trench boot, and there's also meta measured and meta SW update, uh, which provide majority of the functions, uh, majority of the features that we use in the system. And one of the um, um, like a kind of first first uh, component, which is very important, is trench boot landing zone. It is integrated and built from from the Yocto. We use um, Linux kernel version 5.5 uh, with trench boot patches. Those patches are also on mailing lists if you are interested in looking into that. Uh, there are TPM tools. Um, um, the 5.0 uh, version is not yet integrated in meta measured, uh, but sooner or later it would be. Um, so, but but we need new version of TPM two tools to verify do, to read the PCRs, to get event log, event log, to get a quote for attestation, and so on and so on. Uh, to simplify some uh, provisioning of the platform, uh, we use Trammell Hudson Safe Boot project. Uh, or rather it's modified version with the RTM patches uh, sent by Michał Żygowski from 3MD. So this scripts uh, kind of simplify um, disk encryption process, like provisioning of, of root of rootfs description and uh, automatically unsealing of the secret which decrypts the um, which decrypts the um, the rootfs. Only in situation where um, let's say the selected PCRs are correct. So in case of the RTM, we will have PCRs 17 to 22 should be correct uh, to unseal uh, the secret that can decrypt the uh, Lux partition. And then we're using SW update uh, project for um, dual image update, which gives us some additional nice features like uh, power fail safe updates and this kind of stuff. So what are like so are what are the like major major features, uh, major system features here? So first of all, like how we can deploy things. Uh, we can deploy thing uh, this this system through a, uh, like booting over IPXC using uh, HTTPS boot 3 mdebcom um, and then there we have menu IPXC, which you just select the option, and then you boot to the system where you can flash. Um, a new firmware and uh, use BMAP tool to uh, dump the 
OEOC to image to your disk. If you have that, so I'm saying for PC engines, for example, uh, for Protect, it should also work. Then you reboot the platform, and then when you may start provisioning. Of course, at the point of flashing the Dasharo firmware, you're selecting if you want uh, the legacy path or you want to the UF UFE boot path. Then uh, you can reboot, provision the system using save boot scripts uh, and other uh, scripts available in the system. Um, I mentioned, I, I'm repeating like third time that we have this various boot paths, but then you can do verify boot path uh, with read-only boot block if you uh, have uh, correct hardware. Then um, the, the Sharo uh, firmware can be updated. And there are two, two major uh, ways of doing that. Either you're doing that manually through FlashROM and GPG uh, signature verification, of course, uh, uh, everything is available um, on the, like every components will be available on the website, or you completely um, like doing this, that through LDFS FWPD, which is a Linux foundation project for updating the firmware platform. And this is, uh, this works as a daemon in your uh, system. And just when, whenever the new firmware is uh, available, it verifies if it is correct, uh, if this has correct hash, correct signature, and then it flash and inform you that you can reboot the platform or apply uh, other policy. And then we have our OA, uh, Open Embedded Yocto system, uh, which um, uh, can, can use uh, both encrypted and signed updates. And then uh, we have this dual image update, which just uh, toggle itself be, between one image and other through, uh, between the, the updates. And as I mentioned, this is power file safe. Then we can have um, self-decrypting rootfs, um, uh, keeping secret with, in TPM uh, 2.0. We may have this situation when some, something is broken, let's say we flush it, the, or someone like broke our system by flushing malicious um, uh, firmware. And then we can just simply uh, like we typically land in this situation in the recovery mode. Uh, this recovery is a minimal Linux kernel and we can recover from that point. When we boot the system, uh, we, we may decide to attest it. Um, and uh, the support, there is support for attesting both SRTM and DRTM PCRs. But of course, it's up to the user which PCRs uh, should be used for attestation. And right now for Legacy, we have TPM uh, event log support, so we can see how the given components of the system were measured. Uh, we can replay the, that and see if we will get the same measure, uh, measurements uh, using the same binary components if we really care about it. Um, there is need for, uh, to support that for UFI system, of course. And in case of maintenance, uh, we uh, will have uh, public regression test results and continuous integration, continuous deployment um, system, which will produce binary, which we will validate, and then we will sign if those uh, will be released. Okay, so let's maybe show how it look like. Um, this going, uh, so I, I slowed this little bit down just to just you will see something. Uh, but you know, legacy trench boot uh, trench boot boot flow is not very interesting. Uh, so let me. Start that. Uh, okay. This was recorded by Michal, so thanks to him. And you can see, like, we boot in core boot for 12. Um, it, it does various measurements to various PCRs, uh, so you can see uh, those measurements. Then there is PCI enumeration. It's, it's very verbose at this point. Uh, and then we're running LZ, which is kind of uh, like we're dumping a lot because uh, for, for the backing purposes, uh, all the debug options are enabled. And then uh, there was Linux kernel kicked uh, through from LZ. Um, of course, there is grab there, but uh, there is no logs from grab. Uh, it's, it's like, you know, just to put as fast as possible. Of course, like we wanted to show something. That's why we enabled the bug logs. Uh, so Linux kernel takes some time, uh, I believe. Yeah, so the problem would be that the things happen at the bottom. 
Um, so you can see here uh, that um, that there was extension of PCR 17 and 18. Um, and you can see here, for example, that first extension of the PCR 17 is, is called SK init. So that means the SK init special CPU instruction extended the, um, the PCR with the measurement of uh, trench boot landing zone. And then further, we extend uh, bootloader data into PCR18, uh, kernel, um, and and um, yeah, and kernel boot parameters a couple times, and then uh, like boot parameters and then command line into PCR18. So maybe let's look at the more fancy. Um, UFI boot path. Uh, this is boot flow for, uh, so maybe let's start with the provisioning. So UFI requires some provisioning. You have to enter the setup and, and do the provisioning. So the, maybe I can somehow, oh, maybe this would be better. So first we generate the keys. Yeah, this is definitely. Then we run telnet to see what's going on, on the screen, logging to the machine. Yeah, and let's reboot and see uh, what's going on during the boot process. Okay, this would be better to see that on top. So our, the shard of firmware with UFI bootpad boots, we enter the uh, BIOS setup menu, like, which looks a little bit better here. You can see that we have secure boot configuration menu. We can yeah, enable, the, enable it and start provisioning. We can enroll signature. We can look for like where, like of course this was generated and and copied to the system uh, with the previous script. So all uh, all that stuff is done completely open source. Uh, like there is not like proprietary implementation of that. It's it's completely open. Um, it's built in, into the in, into our Dasharo firewall um, open source firmware. So it takes time. So are there any questions so far? Let's see how long it will take. So it, it will take like two minutes. So uh, definitely that's kind of my, my uh, uh, configuration problem because I slow it down this uh, to just you know make sure that we will see something. Okay, we reset the platform.
So Mihal, have you got any comments to that? What's going going on here? Uh, I just wanted to show that uh, secure boot remains enabled, and now we try to put the uh, signed uh, grab binary. Mm -hmm. And as you can see, the secure boot didn't complain. We'll boot to the system, and then reboot and try to boot an unsigned system to prove that uh, the image verification prevents from unauthorized calls from execution. Okay, we rebooting. Yeah, maybe this would be printed on top. Okay, now we will force something which is unsigned. Yeah. So definitely that means that we can uh, create full um, DRTM plus SCRTM um, chain with complete open components. And this, uh, I assume that, uh, Michal, that this, uh, um, this, this boot flow, this, this another video just shows the positive path, yeah? Uh, we just saw the basic path that it boots and um, we showed the PCRs are extended, yeah. So the ah, 17 okay, and okay. PCR is extended. That's all okay, about so, boot flow. Okay, so this is a QFI boot path that just proves the um, the PCRs ex are extended on on UFI boot path also. Yeah, more information um, will be available on dasharo.com website where you can read about this configuration. I assume this was done before secure boot provisioning. Indeed. Yeah, so that's why I should show that, that video first. All the patches for Grab are, are on the mailing list. Um, for Linux are also on mailing list. Uh, those uh, components are also integrated in our GitHub repositories, of course, like there are many branches there, so it's not easy to, to use that. Uh, but if you will contact us, we will definitely support your needs. Yeah, and here we can see that PCR 17 and 18 was extended. And that's it. Okay, so maybe to, to finish, um, so 3MDEP is a company which is which works in various various areas. We're doing core boot development. Uh, we are core boot licensed service providers. We are UFI adopters. We are uh, official consultants for LVFS, FWPD, as well as um, Yocto participants. And recently we joined Open Power Foundation. 
So to some extent, we're trying to, to con connect all our skills and all, all recognize, recognized um, expertise uh, into one image or in, into the software stack, uh, which is open source, can be used by anyone. Um, and uh, to present that as a part of the projects that, that we do and as a part of collaboration with uh, community, also Grab, uh, Grab community. So um, we also provide trainings if you are interested in this kind of um, work, this kind of security architecture, feel free to contact us. Um, we, we, are will, we are willing to support your platform, your needs. So thank you very much for watching and and let's start discussion questions concerns uh, i have a question uh with regards to uh, your presentation uh at one of the uh, slides from the beginning you said that there is no standardized in event log what do you mean by that so um like so maybe there are people that, that try to standardize uh, event log creation. Uh, and there are some documents like, but, but to be honest, like vendors, OEMs, IB, uh, OEMs IBVs, uh, ODMs do not use that. And if you look at, for example, um, let's say ASROC or Supermicro event log, um, you, it's like hard, like hard to understand what's going on there. It's a like complete mess. There is no way to kind of decode that in a sensible manner for uh, to understand like what exact components of proprietary firmware were measured. So that's my kind of uh, so the format and like how you put data there is is standardized, but the problem is what you put that is what you put into the, that data is not standardized. So um, we we saw many times garbage uh, in that. Um, in event log, that's that's why I'm saying the it's not standardized, or whatever you put there, it's not standardized. Okay, so my understanding is that every vendor puts in the in that log uh, something different, and you are not able to uh, identify clearly identify what's happening in the firmware because messaging is not clear. Right. Yes. yes. Okay. So I, I believe you can identify some pieces, uh, and some pieces are clear. So for example, secure boot variables. Uh, so probably the things that are in open specs are okay. So the things from Dixie upstairs, it's like probably to some extent okay, uh, but, uh, but like lower layer like silicon vendor uh, security technologies or I, uh, inter independent BIOS vendor security technologies, the way they doing measurements and drop that into PCRs is, uh, is totally not clear uh, and I don't know if even they understand that um, this is this is this is the state we saw uh, in couple implementations okay thanks a lot another question uh, you mentioned that a grab is an important component of the trench boot but in case of AMD also landing zone requires much uh, a bit more discussion could you tell us uh, what's happening currently in landing zone development right now? Oh, yeah, so that's that's a good question. Uh, I believe we, so the problem is here, like we're using uh, version 0.3.0. Uh, it's it's called, it, it just call it like that. We have stack of patches that have to be upstreamed to, to landing zone. So landing zone is a um, open source DCE implementation for, um, maybe let's go to this slide. Uh, VC implementation um, of um, um, so DC implementation of for DRTM it's like open component in case of Intel we have closed component which is called ACM S init so LZ is kind of counter counterpart uh, on for AMD um, like what's precisely the state of the development to be honest I don't know because um, like I, I believe like we have all major, major features implemented. As you can see, it's, it executes, it measures whatever we need. Um, the, probably the um, internals are more um, something that we have to improve. So for example, some um, DMI, DMA related stuff. Uh, so some IOMMU configuration, uh, 
like kind of um, nitty gritty hardware uh, related stuff. I don't know, Michal, can you add anything to that? Because like I'm probably disconnected from that effort a little bit. So basically what happens currently in the landing zone, um, maybe I will describe the, the, the flow. It would be uh, simpler. So um, first of all, uh, the landing zone initializes its own uh, TPM library um, inside the DCE so that it can extend the PCRs um, by itself. Uh, then, in, then it um, extends the PCR, uh, PCRs with uh, the um, correct modules like kernel, insuram disk, etc. And additionally, if the event log has been uh, passed, the base address and the size, um, the LZ also uh, adds the um, event log entries in uh, standardized uh, format uh, described in the specs. Mm, and of course, uh, adds the LZ hash uh, to the event log because uh, since the processor does the measurement and extends the PCR, it doesn't create the event log for this event. So we store uh, the, the LZ hash that is supposed to be extended in PCR 17 and just add it to the event log. And um, that's basically everything. OK, thanks. You mentioned trusted drop two, and it's using a using interface one AH. Is it something which still makes sense to uplift into mainstream grab two, or is it something which can be forgotten? Yeah, so I I wonder about that. Uh, so I think the trench boot uh, kind of work around that problem. Um, and if we agree that trench boot is viable option and we like it, then probably it doesn't make sense. Uh, but uh, but you know I don't know how much how many uh, people use uh, legacy boot path and how long it would still be important. Uh, and it, yeah, so it will be very it will be will stay important for uh, probably for a very long time. Okay. Okay, but still the, the issue here is uh, despite we, um, so, so how we can do that? Like it, I discussed that topic on LPC 2019 uh, and like Matthew Garrett said that, yeah, this is, this is the path we should go, that we should try to implement that interface, but you know, who will do that? From, uh, from our perspective, like a trusted grab to be honest, use that interface, I believe, from uh, from CBIOS. Am I correct, Michal, or am I messing something? Or they implemented that, that themselves? Uh, yes, basically, um, their intention was to use the CBIOS interface uh, for the TPM. Mm -hmm. I, yes. I, mean, I mean, it's not only about CBIOS, but uh, also about uh, other BIOS vendors who probably also have one AH. Uh, yeah, so, uh, okay. Yeah, so there are other vendors, at least I saw some uh, uh, boot option, some BIOS menus with this option. Uh, but to be honest, I'm, I'm not sure how good those in implementation are and how much we can assume about that. So for example, with CBIOS, there is a trick uh, because CBIOS um, also can support TPM 2.0 with that. Uh, and they kind of like, it's, uh, this is not by the spec. They just doing that probably somehow like themselves uh, um, because they decided that this makes sense. Uh, but uh, in case of the um, probably older platforms which implement that in BIOS, uh, this would be probably all the time uh, 1.2 um, TPM. And to be honest, I don't know how, um, if this is still, very useful and it still will work, for example, with uh, with the modern flows that we're talking about. Um, 
I don't know, like Daniel, it's like 1.2 works with with Trench Boot. Like uh, you probably had more platforms with 1.1.2 for mm. Intel, or as not? Far, as far as I can tell, all older ICMs uh, support 1.2, but newer ones uh, do uh, just support only 2.0. Uh, okay. Personally, I was playing with platforms which currently supports only 2.0, and also 2.0 or even format lock is only supported at this point. So uh, I do not expect that um, something somebody will need uh, to support all the platforms at at this point. But uh, mm -hmm. uh, uh, one thing uh, which so what's interesting for me is, is uh, that Vladimir said that um, the issue with one uh, AH uh, interrupt will be important for uh, for many years starting from now. And uh, why did you say that, uh, Vladimir? No, I mean that um, using BIOS interface is uh, is still around and it will probably re remain around for for years to come. Yes, but do you think that we will need to support a, a, a measurement functionality for these BIOSes? Probably not that much, but uh, yeah, this, the question is basically how much work it is. Since we already have most of the TPM stuff uh, in Grub anyway, probably just having one AH, it shouldn't be too much, much of a deal. Mm -hmm. My understanding, I, I'm not against the adding the func this functionality to the grab, uh, but I think that um, mm, uh, it should be done. With, it should be done, done by somebody who needs uh, that functionality. At this point, I accept uh, your uh, request, Peter. I haven't seen any any interest in in, in this uh, in this functionality in the grab. I think. Uh, yeah. So I, I I think like that. So also Christian mentioned that that the problem with um, what we have right now is kind of a signature of LZ or placing LZ in a in a place that that uh, we are sure that it was not replaced or or we verified. Of course, like if we were run incorrect LZ, then we have incorrect me measurements and so on and so on uh, in SK init. Like so we can detect that. Uh, but uh, can we prevent uh, loading the um, invalid LZ or because let's say we have DRTM in launch and it works all the time everyone every time we boot the platform and so this is this could be kind of the signature verification of the of the um, of anything we provide for um, S launch uh, module parameter um, could be something uh, important I think. But yeah, I think that it, uh, it is important to some extent, but I think that we do not need a uh, uh, measurement functionality to, uh, uh, to this thing. Uh, I think that we can use uh, signature, verification, uh, uh, signature verification for this. Of course, yeah, the yeah, question yeah. is what, yeah. what kind of signature verification we need. Yeah, so whatever is simpler for for grab, I believe. Uh, like maybe this is like maybe this is like zero effort, like. Uh, at this point, I don't know. at this point, you are able at least to use uh, PGP verification. If we have uh, uh, the functionality uh, uh, on which Daniel Extens is working on, then we will have also support for X509 signatures. So I think that this shouldn't be a problem. Um, I, I, at this point, I do not see any major reason, and except, no for fun, except for fun. Uh, have a support for uh, BIOS uh, measurement, measurements, let's say. Maybe maybe I'm missing something, but uh, at least uh, for now, I do not see any reason to to have uh, urgent need for, for this. For this. Well, point. obviously it's not urgent. Yeah. Yeah, so in terms of uh, signature verification, I just wonder, so how this, um, how we can handle uh, trusting the uh, public key, like how we handle public key, keeping the public key. Are we using like some? I mean, le I will leverage, leverage uh, like what 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 security of public key we can we can kind of provide, because let's say we have 
someone will sign that with some malicious uh, uh, malicious keys and just will replace if this is not protected if the public part is not protected then everything can then look for us credible um, so how how this is solved right now Vladimir, mm, I haven't used PGP uh, verification, so I'm not sure because at uh, this point, for, for GNU PG verification, uh, you use the uh, most people would use detached signatures, just so as to not to modify the original files, and then then the key for the verification is stored typically is stored in the Grub itself, and Grub is verified before loading by firmware in a in chains exactly in chains of trust exactly like it was in the first part of the today's present of the today's yeah. This mini summit yeah okay. yeah yeah sorry go ahead please. okay yeah that's, that's that makes sense that makes sense so we kind of built in uh built in the public part in the bootloader uh, and then we use that for uh the touch signature verification of lz and definitely this can be done inside the inside the config and let's say if the config and bootloader is is verified um, uh, by secure boot for example or or some verified boot uh, mechanism uh, that that makes sense i and i believe we should for lz we should have the build artifacts by default uh, like this so we should get the but the question is who will sign that uh, that's that's kind of another uh, issue but this is maybe discussion with the trench boot people Mm. Uh, uh, one question for Vladimir: How how the PGP public keys embed, embedded into core core uh, grab image? As the same way as any as the early models are embedded. Okay, so you you just give a a, a path to the uh, key public key to the yes. MK image config file. Okay. Yes. Okay, uh, Peter, and uh, with regards um, to LZ, I, I, as I remember, I discussed this with Christian, and uh, let's say we thought that the best approach would be to have a kind of a P header or something like that, because then you are able to have a support for shim or shim verification. Okay, oh, hi. P, P header. Okay, uh, I, 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 we discussed this, this some time ago, so maybe I'm so, missing something. But but my understanding is that we will, we will come to the conclusion that in case of UFI secure boot, it makes to uh, it makes sense to have a P header or something like that. Which yeah. So the question is rather like I'm okay. Uh, the question is like what is more work? I believe like one thing is doing whatever we can right now. And then maybe doing whatever is uh, correct TM uh, in in longer run. Maybe like uh, I don't know like how hard is PE uh, like PE target or some wrapper around LZ, so it will still work uh, with our current implementation and so on. Uh, and by the way, yeah, go ahead. Yeah, by the way, the the, the patches uh, were sent. Like we rebased the patches. Probably we did some mess uh during the rebase so if you can kind of um tell us how we should handle the situation in which the old patches for uh, for intel txt were sent and do not apply to current master um uh, we just did the rebase and of course that means that the author was messed up and so on and so on and we added then our patches for for amd so probably we have to clean this uh, clean this out and the, then if you have suge suggestion for this um how to integrate PE header? Uh, maybe at this point we should also discuss that through mailing list. Yes, yes, I think that we should meet and discuss how to to have a signature verification for Z. I'm not saying that uh, uh, we have to do that uh, using P header at this point. I think that it makes sense, mm -hmm. uh, but it, I'm aware that it requires more discussion. And if we go P header way. I'm able to help because I did a, a PE a header work, let's say, for Zen at some point. So I'm to some extent I'm familiar how it works. Uh, so I'm able to help. Yeah. So it. so this this works well for um, for UFI path, uh, but what about the legacy path? 
So for the I think that I think that this 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 shouldn't be a problem also because parsing of PE header and getting the signature from it is, is it, it is quite easy. It requires a, a few instructions. So but but it is it should be uh, it should be integrated in the bootloader or uh, like who should do who should do verification? Um, yeah. So because like I assume that in case of UFI path you will use. UFI boot services or whatever services. The... Um, depends uh, how would you like to, to load LZ. Of course, this requires some discussion, but to some extent, if you use the platform which depends on, on the shim uh, uh, verification mechanism, then you can call into, uh, into this mechanism and to verify the signature. So it is easy, just one call. Mm -hmm. uh, if you would if you would like to do this uh, yourself in the grab, it requires a, 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 a little more effort, but also it is it is not, not so much complicated because you just have to have parsed the header, which is quite simple, and the header points you to the uh, to the place in the file which contains uh, uh, the signature. Uh, and then after that, you can use uh, X, X509, uh, X509 uh, code to verify this, uh, this signature. So I think this, this also doesn't require um, much work. Anyway, uh, I'm happy to help with this work and to dis and discuss the design, how, how, we, how we should do that. But I think that this functionality shouldn't require um, a lot of effort. Okay. And okay. Uh, detached signatures uh, obviously require on only embedding the correct uh, correct keys. Yeah, the same course. for appended signature, uh, signatures. Yes, yeah, sure. Yeah, so definitely the detached signature is uh, way slim, simpler, uh, but maybe you know the correct TM is. is uh, another thing which is important in case of LZ, my expectation is that we have more than one LZ binary. And uh, at least uh, in case of ACM, uh, I'm going to introduce a, a mechanism into the grab, which goes through all ACMs and choose uh, automatically which ACM will be loaded and on a given platform. We can do that because uh, the ACM contains information about all uh, supported platforms. Uh, so I think that it it will be nice to have this, the the same mechanism for LZ, uh, where Grab is able to go for all for, uh, all uh, LZ uh, binaries and choose automatically uh, the correct uh, LZ. Yeah, uh, but but I don't think it is needed. Like maybe I'm like I wonder what kind of custom things LZ will have to do for uh, given. I chatted with about that with Andre Cooper at some point, and he expressed, uh, he told me that he thinks that due to uh, uh, limited uh, uh, size, uh, the size limitation for LZ, uh, we are not be able to to put all the code which is needed to support all AMD platform. Maybe at this point, uh, 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 we'll be able to support all platforms using one LZ, but maybe in the future it will not be possible because uh, we have to add more and more more features. So yeah, yeah, yeah. So so I believe this is uh, probably discussion about this IOMMU stuff and how. Cool. Uh, yeah. So I uh, so IOMMU uh, somehow have to be configured and and probably should be configured for every hardware in different way. Uh, or yeah. a little bit different configuration, which means either we detect what platform we're dealing with, and then we apply the configuration, which means more code, of course. Um, either we have various LZ, we just like, okay, uh, this this have to be loaded uh, for this platform. But yeah, so that means that loading different LZ may break the um, trust in the platform, or even may kind of cause some additional an unintentional results in like if it's done completely in a different way. I don't know how this so is solved in ACM. I know that there are various binaries, but what if you load like like do, do you get any error or what what's going on if you're trying to uh, load? I didn't try, but I think that, that um, the, the get the get sec instruction uh, uh, will return an error that uh, uh, this. Uh, 
this uh, ACM does not work on this on this platform. So you simply are not able to execute um, uh, an ACM if it doesn't match a given platform. Uh, simply, and I think that it should also work uh, in, uh, in case of LZ. Anyway, um, I think that this back to the discussion to how to wrap an LZ binary in, into in, into an, a header, and maybe p header is a good solution because uh, because it contains uh, some support for the signatures, but uh, also the functionality which I said with regards to the, the, the platform detection requires much more information, uh, requires more, more discussion. So I think that this, this header issue should be discussed. I did this in, uh, discussion initially with Christian, uh, but I think that we agreed that it requires uh, more discussion in wider forum, I think. Um, okay, so what about uh, like roadmap for merging those patches? Like how you see that? Like, like luckily we have you here and I just wonder like... Uh, yes, um, the plan currently is that, uh, as I said, uh, currently in uh, freeze code and I'm going to freeze the code. Um, I hope by, by the end of November, no later than at the turn of, the, of December, I think that we quite close to that uh, uh, to that point and then release uh, the grab uh, after after the, the December uh, so not December by the end of December practically it, it means that I hope that it will happen before Christmas mm -hmm. and then after that uh, I hope that we'll be able to release uh, uh, an Intel patch set which will not be in RFC state and then we will be able to discuss uh, all, uh, all, 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 all the patches on the, on the mailing list. But can you roughly say like, uh, you know, uh, roughly say what, you know, what would be the worst case date, <laughs> I would say? Uh, merging of these patches? Yeah. Uh, uh, I hope that uh, no later than the end of uh, uh, half. The, uh, the end of first half of next year, but this is the worst case. So uh, that means uh, 2.08? Uh, or, or whatever, how uh, yeah. next, ver next release, I hope that uh, we'll have uh, uh, the DRTM functionality, at least for Intel, but I hope also that for AMD. In general- no, for AMD, we have to include that AMD stuff. <laughs> I okay. believe our, our so patches- to some extent, yeah. it depends on you and, of yeah. course, on me. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So uh, I, I believe this is like that. Like, uh, the, this patches, so patches work. Uh, the, the like question is what kind of concerns we may have. But to be honest, like LZ is not the concern here because LZ is not part of uh, of Grab project, and uh, and you have to so like ACM. Yeah. So you don't like. You don't care about whatever is in ACM and what is on their roadmap there. To yeah. some extent, to some extent, I care about uh, LZ um, because, as I said, I would like to um, have a functionality in the grab which detects the platform and loads correct uh, LZ uh, uh, automatically. So I would like to drop one manual step from uh, from. Uh, uh, from the grab configuration. So to some extent, I care about how uh, LZ is wrapped, let's say. Okay. Uh, but, but, in, but in general, I think that other pieces of code, uh, which to some extent are common for Intel and AMD will not change much in the, at this stage, I think. Uh, mostly there will be some fixes and cleanups for, 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 uh, for Intel code, uh, and uh, interspecific code and some improvements, I, I, I think. I hope that at this stage we'll not be changing the core things of, of, of the patches which were posted on, on, on the mail. In, okay. In May, sorry. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, okay, but the, the problem is this is kind of like um, who will validate those, uh, all those platforms uh, supported by LZ? Because, you know, we're posting the patches. And to be honest, we are not exactly the, 
the the entity that has all the possible platforms or at least so we may have we, we have three platforms yeah we have um we have uh, the old one the the old g series pc engines one we have as rock uh, which is ryzen and we have um epic uh super micro epic and we can confirm on those platforms that you know as is detected and then it's uh, the, the feature of detecting that works but what about other other things? I believe like anyone who wants to have LZ supporting these additional platforms should kind of do the work uh, around LZ you know, and contribute to upstream LZ uh, implementation. Sure, uh, but I think that at I'm not going to uh, force you to verify all platforms, let's say. It doesn't make sense, of course. Mm -hmm. uh, I'm happy with initial support for uh, two free platforms that's okay for me uh, okay mm, that's it uh, i think that we uh, i to some extent i think that we are able to predict what we need uh, um, uh, for the grab and what we expect from lz how it should present for to the grab or something like that uh, but as i said i do not expect any uh, official uh, uh, how to say it uh verification that uh, all platform or amd platforms work it doesn't make sense i think if somebody discovered that something doesn't work on a given platform uh, they should provide uh, the fixes for it that's it mm -hmm, mm -hmm. okay okay so i i believe like we kind of exhausted the the topic like it's after six uh in, in central, central europe time uh, thank you very much for attending. Uh, thank you, Alexander. Thank you, uh, Vladimir. Thank you, Daniel. Um, and other Daniel who also attended the, and presented the great talk about um, signatures verification and support for power. Um, so like we see each other, like I hope in the same uh, group uh, next week, uh, Tuesday, and we will see another in interesting talk. I believe Daniel, you will present um if i if I'm, yeah if i'm co correct um and we will have a nine elements presentation about xhci support in in graph so thank you very much everyone uh stay health and uh, talk to you next week thank you guys bye thanks bye thank you bye, -bye. bye, -bye.